You're listening to the Sunday podcast from Life Point Church in Santan Valley, Arizona. We hope you are encouraged by today's message. For more information, visit us online at lifepointaz.com. Good morning. <laughs> Connie's, Connie's heckling me already. I can hear it already. This week, we'll be away from John and looking at David. <laughs> Let's backtrack just a little second. Who had a great Independence Day? Yay! Oh, mine was pretty good too. Had some cool families over. I won't tell you who they are because I want to. I want to be part of the cool club. Okay. <laughs> Connie says no. Um, did you all flag your Betsy Ross flags high? Yes. Never, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Silly things happen in America, don't they? Yes, they do. So what did you guys do wrong to be stuck here with the junior high pastor, right? It's a little different. <laughs> junior hires right there, and there's some over there. Any other junior hires out there? Whoop, whoop. Connie's a junior hire today. Yeah. All right. So yes, we will be on a different track than the book of John. However, it's still from the Bible. Okay. And we will speak of Jesus at the end. It will happen. Uh, we will be in the book that I'm sure you wake up to every morning within your devotionals and you open your Bible to Chronicles and read through. Yes? Do you all do that? Yeah? I was debating on Samuel or Chronicles because the story's in both of them and I just like the wording in Chronicles better because it gets more to the point that this is David's decision. He did this on his own. And we'll be talking about David in his pride and his fall into humility. Uh, situation they go through in, in counting the Israelites. And as we look at that and we think back to that situation where he's sinning uh, to the other situation of Bathsheba and Uriah in humanly speaking, we look at the Bathsheba thing and go, that was horrible. That's the worst thing ever. There, there's, you could call it rape and there's definitely murder involved there. He, d- he did bad things. But in, and it was bad. <laughs> but in the counting of the people, he's actually directly going against God himself. So in my book, that's even worse than what he did with Bathsheba and Uriah. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. Um, I'm going to have a few various Bibles that I'm going to use today, one of which is, is the app on the phone. And that's just a little mini lesson in itself. I like to do these kind of things with, with the youth. The simple fact of we can have the Bible with us all day long. And all throughout our day, we can be going back and looking at the scriptures and reading more and more and, and instilling that into our daily lives. So I I also have, I got for Christmas a couple years ago, a beautiful Christmas present that I didn't know it it was that beautiful in the first place. When I first got it, I went, oh great, you gave me the Bible. I have some. Um, But a friend of ours, a family friend, they gave us the Bibliotheca Bible. And it's not just this book, it's four books. It's, It's the Bible Bible, but it's in four books. And what they did is, it's really unique and really awesome, is they wanted the Bible to read fluently and easily so you would grab it up and not want to put it down. So they, they did tests and they got the, the font that was the easiest to read and most relaxing on the eyes, that kind of thing. Not to put you to sleep, but to keep you focused. And the type of paper and color of paper. And then they went back to the original text and they, they did their own version of the Bible. That sounds weird when I say version, doesn't it? It's like, no, it's not the true Bible. But no, it is. Um, what's so cool about this is they didn't worry about being like ESV or NIV and saying we have to have proper English sentence structure as we write that. They, they wrote it more word for word, and I love that because I have always stunk at English and grammar, so it just, it makes my heart happy when I read the same thing within the Bible. So, uh, when I read through Chronicles, because I was going through the whole Bible again, because I started on this in the book of Genesis, and uh, it's set up a little differently. The last book of the Old Testament is Chronicles. One book, not two. <laughs> Really thick, really intimidating, and really dry. And by the way, yeah, we're not doing the prayer of Jabez. That's normally why you go to Chronicles. And we're not doing that. We're doing David. Um, So you think, oh my gosh, can anything good come out of Chronicles besides the prayer of Jabez? But yes, the answer is yes. And we'll be looking at that today. So before we dive into it, let me pray and get my heart and my mind focused correctly. And here we go. 
Dear Lord, thank you for this day, and thank you for, once again, another opportunity to speak on your behalf on your, of your word, Lord Jesus. Uh, may you use me today. May you build up each and every one of us in our walks with you, Lord. Take us to that next level in our walk through this conversation today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to be in 1 Chronicles 21, and we're going to be going through the verses 1 through 17. We're going to go through 1 through 8 first, and then finish off with this. Um, as I read through here, we have NIV on the wall because this is kind of new and nobody has it on an app or anywhere else. So it's going to look a little bit different, but you're going to, you're going to hear the wording from me. And just a footnote, this one uses Yahweh instead of Lord or God. It uses Yahweh. Y-H. <laughs> Connie's excited about this. Let's get going, shall we? <laughs> First sentence, 21 one. And an adversary stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So if you have NIV, it's going to say Satan is the one who, who moved David to, to do this sin of counting Israel. We'll, we'll talk about why that's a sin in just a minute here. If you go to 2 Samuel, it states that the anger of the Lord moved David to sin. But that kind of gets us off track because we think that God's making, God is making somebody sin and he would never do that. And the sentence is just written, I say, poorly because that's not what's happening. God's allowing it to happen is more of the conversation as opposed to God saying, David, you're going to sin right now. Do it. He would never do that. So what I like about this version of Bible is it says an adversary, small a, so it's not Satan. It's not like capital A. An adversary stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So David, it's more on David's shoulders. It's his burden. He's the one making this decision. He sees the Philistines coming that Achilles healed to him. He never can get away from them. And he sees them coming and he steps into the sin of counting Israel. Next sentence. And David said to Joab and to the princes of the people, go, number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan and bring me word that I may know the sum of, the sum of them. And Joab said, may Yahweh make his people a hundred times as many as they are, but my Lord, the king, are they not all my Lord's servants? Why does my Lord require this thing? Why will he be a cause of guilt to Israel? Joab's a pretty righteous, smart, wise man of the Bible. And he's saying, no, 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 no. This is going against God, David. We don't want to do this. Are you sure you want to do this? David's king. You do what the king says. He's got to do it. Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. So Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. And Joab gave up the sum of the number of the people to David. And all those of Israel were a thousand thousands and a hundred thousand men whom he drew sword. What I also like about this is it makes you do math. You have to think about the number. And Judah was 470,000 men who drew swords. I almost put the W in there again. I do, I've done that all my life. But Levi and Benjamin, he did not count among them. For the king's word was abominable to Joab. Again, Joab's righteous. He knows it's wrong. He doesn't want to do this. And it was evil in the eyes of God concerning this thing. And he smote Israel. Have, have you been smoted lately? Anyone out there smoted? No? I've been smoted before. It's not fun. And David said to God, I have sinned greatly in that I have done this wrong. But now put away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. I love that last sentence. And by the way, I took out the yays in there. There's a bunch of yays. And so when you see me stutter and stop and go, there's a yay in there. They like to do that a lot in this, this text. Um, but David, is, his, re, his reaction to this is awesome in that last sentence. And this is what we're going to dwell upon is the fact that he realized he did wrong. He accepts ownership of making that poor decision. He realized he has sinned and he's been very foolish. That's pretty cool. So there's two questions at the end of this, this paragraph right here that we have to ask ourselves. And one is, what made David prideful and want to do this in the first place? What drove him to this sin? And two, why is it a sin? We'll go through the first one. What drove him to being this way? Is you turn to your left in your Bibles to chapter 20. Because in a war previous to this, you're going to see something that happens that uh, kind of builds up the pride in David. So, chapter 20, verse 1 through 2. And it came to pass at the time of the return of the people, 
at the time when kings go out to battle, that Joab led forth the army and wasted the country of the children of Ammon and came and besieged Rabbah. He wasted the country. He annihilated them. But David, David tarried at Jerusalem, and Joab smote Rabbah and overthrew it. And David took the crown of their king from off his head and found it to weigh a talent of gold. And there were precious stones in it, and it was set up upon David's head. And he brought forth the spoil of the city exceeding much. His people go out to war. Joab's leading the people. They annihilate these people. They take back all the nice stuff from their, their, uh, their areas, their cities, their towns. And they bring back to King David, one of which is this beautiful gold crown heavy gold crown, full of gold, and full of precious, awesome jewels. And he's wearing it on his head, and as that, from that point forward is when we go into that turn, the Philistines are coming, he says, I gotta count the men. What, what I see in that, in that moment where he puts that crown on his head, it, he realizes, oh wow, I am a king. And not only am I a king, I am the king of Israel. We are some bad motor scooters. No one can compare to us. They come up to fight us, we annihilate them. We take their stuff. Sometimes we save the women and children. Sometimes they don't survive. You don't mess with Israel. We're bad. And I'm their leader. I'm king. That's what I see when, when he gets that, that, that crown. And then you, you turn the page and you get into the next chapter. And he's, going, he's counting his men. Why would you count the men back in this day and age? You would have two reasons. One, to see if you stack up against the people you're going to fight against. Do you have enough army compared to their amount of army, right? And the other, I think this is more the direction David's going. The other is to say, look how big and powerful we are. We, Israel, me, King David. You're going to try to attack this, you Philistines? Didn't I, didn't I take you out once with a little stone in a slingshot? Yeah, I think so. You better back off. Step back. That's where I see King David going in in this moment. So that's the pride issue that's coming up. And now we got to know, why is this a sin? It seems kind of silly. The, the biggest sinful part of it is the simple fact of David is not relying upon God. He has the great God Almighty, and he's seen the work of God throughout his entire life. And he, sees what, he has seen what happened when he goes in the wrong direction with David and, I'm sorry, with uh, Bathsheba and Uriah. So he knows the power of God. He knows what God will do if you go against him. But yet, he's getting caught up in this stuff. God knew that we were so prideful and so full of ourselves that years prior to that with Moses, he actually made a law about this kind of situation. Sounds weird, doesn't it? Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to go through this to get you the next verse. Exodus 30. Verses 11 through 16, I believe. And this is the law that God gave Moses about counting your, your people of Israel. Then the Lord, Lord spoke to Moses saying, when you take the census of the children of Israel to their number, then every man shall give a ransom to himself to the Lord. When you number them, that there may be no plague among them when you number them. Did you catch that? When you number them, take the ransom so there's not a plague when you number them. I like how God, God is redundant. He has to smack us in the head several times. This is what everyone among those who are numbering shall give. Half a shekel according to the shekel of the, of the sanctuary. The half shekel shall be an offering to the Lord, every, everyone included among the, those who are numbered. For 20 years old and above shall give an offering to the Lord. The rich shall not give more than, and the poor shall not give less than a half shekel. When you give an offering to the Lord to make atonement for yourselves. And you shall take the atonement money of the children of Israel and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of meeting that it may be a memorial for the children of Israel before the Lord to make atonement for yourself. A little too dry of reading? A little true? A little? Maybe? Yeah. The important part is verse 12. When you take a census of the people of Israel, when you're numbering how many people you have, how many men you have in your army, when you're trying to see if you can stack up against somebody, when you're trying to see if you're all big and powerful and that you want to flex your muscles, you need to take an offering for that from each and every individual or I will start to make each and every individual sick. I will bring a plague. I will take, bring pestilence upon you. Because remember, I'm God. I'm leading you. You are my people. 
more than I am your God. You are my people. I created you. I put you in this place in the first place. I am here for you. Don't forget about that. So yes, God actually made a law about counting the people of Israel. So obviously, uh, David has sinned just in that alone. And we know the bigger sin is that it was a prideful direction he was going in the first place. But he changed his heart, which is awesome. So coming back to chapter 21 in Chronicles, we'll be in verse 9. And Yahweh spoke to, to Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and speak to David, saying, Thus says Yahweh, I offer you three things. He's given a choice between three things. Choose for yourself one of them, that I may do it for you. So Gad came to David and said to him, Thus says Yahweh, Take which you will, either three years of famine or three months to be consumed before your foes while the sword of your enemies overtake you. Or else three days the sword of Yahweh when pestilence in the land and the angel of Yahweh destroying throughout all the borders of Israel. So that's your choices. None of them too good, right? When you're doing wrong and there's uh, discipline coming, it's never a choice you really desire, right? Your uh, parents as you're younger might be saying, well, let's see, you want to clean the whole entire house by yourself? Do you want spankings? Or should I wait for your father to come home with a belt? Which choice would you like? You don't want any of them, but you, you try to choose which, which do I like the most out of the least of those, right? So you either got three years of famine, you have other people coming in for 30 days, the Philistines, and they're going to be cutting you down, they're going to be killing you off, or you can have God kind of doing the same thing, only with angels, and that's never a pretty sight. Ask the Egyptians or read Revelations and see the end of times, right? It's never anything pleasant. And David said to Gad, I am in a great strait. How many times do we say that? You're in a big problem. I'm in a great strait. You were just saying that the other day, weren't you, Emma? Yes, she was. I'm in a great strait. Let me fall into the... <laughs> there's that pray again. Let me fall into the hand of Yahweh. For, every great, for very great are his mercies. And let me not fall into the hand of man. So David makes a wise decision. He says, yeah, God's going to give me some discipline. It's going to hurt. He's going to spank, but he's a merciful God. So I know I'm going to get what's coming to me, but he's not going to go overboard. And I might be able to talk him out of some of it. Not likely, but maybe. And Yahweh sent a pestilence upon Israel, and there fell the Israel of Israel 70,000 men. That's quite a few guys. And God sent an angel of Jeru to Jerusalem, I can't say Jerusalem, Jerusalem to destroy it. And had, as he was about to destroy, Yahweh beheld, and he repented of the evil and said to the destroying angel, it is enough. Now stay your hand. And the angel of Yahweh was standing by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of Yahweh standing between the earth and the heavens, having a drawn sword in his hand, stretching out over Jerusalem. And David and the elders, clothed in sackcloth, fell upon their faces. And David said to God, it is not I who commanded the people to be numbered. I'm sorry, is it not I? He's taken responsibility for it. Is it not I who commanded the people to be numbered? It is I who have sinned and done very wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, O Yahweh, my God, be against me and against my father's house, but not against your people, that they should be plagued. I think that is so awesome that David turns in that moment. He accepts responsibility for his actions. He states, no, 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 I did wrong. And he says, yeah, give me discipline, God. Then he sees the discipline coming over all his people. And he goes, God, God, no, stop, God. It's, it's my fault. I'm the shepherd of these people. They're just the sheep. They're just following my command. They're, they're just going the direction I sent them in. Don't make them pay for my, for my responsibilities. Give it to me, God. Take me. I can never fully worship and then speak afterwards. And I, I don't learn ever. Mouth gets so dry. In my life, I had a situation where I can kind of... Uh, understand where, where uh, David is in this moment of this, taking this responsibility and seeing the effects of his actions coming down on people that don't deserve it, the innocent people. Um, over around 16 years ago, a little over 16 years ago, wife is pregnant with our youngest daughter, Cammie, 
And it, it's a bad era of, of Mike and Colleen's marriage. And I, I'm causing a lot of anxiety and disruption within the marriage. And as most of you know, junior hires don't know this, most of you know the, the woman who's pregnant, if she's not physically healthy and mentally healthy, there's going to be issues with the baby. And Colleen is going through a lot of anxiety during that time. Cammy comes out and she's not the healthy baby like our other three daughters always were. And she's a little, she's scrawny and small, and she's not, she doesn't eat very much. And so within that first week of her life outside of the womb, uh, feel free to read in, into that, um, she was not doing well at all. I, I come into the bedroom, and Colleen is there, and tears in her eyes, still hits me today. And she's saying, Cammie, she's just, she's not eating. I changed her diaper. She didn't cry. She's just lethargic. And we're all like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, go to the hospital. And at this time, she's our fourth kid, and our, our other three older kids are still quite young. And so she takes Cammie to the hospital, and I'm stuck at home, the, and the other kids, they're, they're in their bed they're in the bed sleeping and stuff, and I, I'm just bawling. It, it's the nasty, gross, disgusting, bawling, crying, uh, and crying out to my Lord and Savior. And it's the same direction that, that David was going there. It's like, God, it is my fault. I'm the one who sinned. I caused this. Take me, Lord. Don't take my baby. She doesn't deserve this. She doesn't deserve to go through this, this, this discomfort and this, this death, Lord. Give it to me. And I, I truly... I truly felt that he, he, would, he would take me. I really did because I just felt so horrible about what I had done in that moment. But like David, and how many of you know the verse James 4.10? I'll say the King James Version, really throw you off. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Just like David, me in that moment, I humbled myself before him and he lifted me up. He lifted our family up and he blessed the, me and those around us from that point forward because I humbled myself. Because prior to that, it was about me, right? It was my prideful me about this life is about me and, and these things should happen for me and this kind of thing. Despite the fact that I thought I was, because I was a Christian then too, I thought I was giving a lot over to God. I wasn't giving everything over to God. And when I humbled myself and gave that to him and fell down on my knees and said, God, I am not worthy. Take me. He said, perfect. That's exactly where I need you. And from there, he just exploded my life with him. And I think he did the same thing with David. David, he'd already used David a lot, but he continues to bless David throughout his life as king over Israel. So he lifted David back up. We're going to talk about a couple other kings as well. Because if any of you read Old Testament, in which... And, and that alone you should do. You should read Old Testament. Uh, we'll go through this little example. I'll do it with the youth all the time. Your, your New Testament is this big. Old Testament, this big. There's much more Old Testament than there is New Testament, right? This, this Bible is even better at exclaiming that. This is a third of the Old Testament in this, this publication. And the New Testament is a little bit smaller than this book. There's a lot of information in the Old Testament and we tend to get obsessed with New Testament. We should be, but we should be obsessed with the whole entire Bible. Because yes, we need to know that Jesus, God, has come down and died for us. He's saving us from our sins as long as we allow him to be in our lives, as long as we accept that. And we need to know how to live, read the New Testament on knowing what Jesus tells us, how Jesus tells us how to live, and how uh, Paul and the others talk about this is the way we should be living and doing church and that kind of thing. We need to know that. But there's a lot of information in this Old Testament. There's a lot more pages in that Old Testament and it all reflects the fact that Jesus is coming and we need to live this way. So as you're obsessing on Old Testament and building that up within your, your memory and placing that in your lives, yeah, you don't have to have sacrifices. Jesus is the ultimate sacrifices. But within those sacrifices, what they're about and all the other stuff in the Old Testament, it all builds up. It makes a deeper conversation in the New Testament when you know that. Okay? All right. Going back to the lesson. There's just a little added extra deal. It won't cost you anything today. <laughs> We're going to hit up a couple more um, kings. They're off the David's line. So it's the kings of Judah. Uh, just a little more 
positive reinforcement that yes, there can be righteousness within people within times of unrighteousness, right? Because we'd say in this day and age in America and in the world, there's a lot of sinful worldly living going on. It just seems to be multiplying decade after decade after decade, right? Wasn't any different throughout the kings of Israel and Judah. So we're going to go to 2 Chronicles 31 and talk about King Hezekiah. And again, if you guys are reading Old Testament stuff and you're going through Kings and Samuel and Chronicles, first time I went through Kings, I got depressed because I said, is there no hope for mankind? Because it's like, good king, bad king, bad king, bad king, bad king, worst king, good king, okay, bad king. Yeah. It's like, we never learn. Don't, don't we look into history? Don't we learn that history repeats ourself? Young people, history repeats itself. Learn history. Don't repeat yourself. <laughs> 2 Chronicles 31, 20, and 21, as I get myself there, and this is King Hezekiah. This is, and by the way, um, Babylon is about, in a few more generations, is going to take Judah and exile them from their land, okay? It's, it's getting close. This is what Hezekiah did throughout Judah, doing what is good and right and faithful before the Lord his God. In everything that he undertook in the service of God's temple and in obedience to the law and in the commands, he sought his God and worked wholeheartedly, and so he prospered. He lived righteously for God, he prospered. Prior to that, there's a bunch of kings following false gods, setting up false idols within the temple, that kind of thing, sacrificing their children in the fire. Uh, God never has asked for you to do that. Uh, so those, they're way off the deep end. And that's why the Babylonians, Babylonians rather, are coming soon. But King Hezekiah is on the right track. Jump backward or forwards, rather, to 32, 7, and 8. A little bit more about Hezekiah. Pretty awesome situation. Scary situation and awesome all at the same time. The, uh, the Assyrians have come into Judah. Hezekiah is in Jerusalem, the city, and he's talking to his men because the Assyrians want to come take over Jerusalem as well. They've already hit up some other cities within Judah, and they're knocking on Jerusalem's door. Verse 7, he's talking to his men, Hezekiah is. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria and the vast army with him. For there is a greater power with us than with him. With him is only the arm of flesh, but with with us is the Lord our God to help us to fight the battles. And the people gain confidence from Hezekiah and the, the king of Judah. How many battles do we go through where we forget that? How many times do we forget that? All the time? Can we say all the time? 99% of the time? We have the Lord God Almighty on our side. If you're a Christian, if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit is inside you. God is inside of you, right? God is always there. Yeah, we go through some pretty tough battles. Uh, we, we get to pray over a lot of your tough battles on a weekly basis when we have our staff meeting. And, and there's health issues and there's relationship issues and there's things outside of our controls and they're, they're huge and they're big. And yeah, alone, you yourself, you cannot fight that battle. But you don't have just your flesh fighting that battle. You have your God fighting that battle with you. We need to remember that day in and day out. Hey, we're, we're really good at forgetting that. But we got to encourage each other. Hey, remember? It's not just flesh that's, that we have here. Yeah, they have flesh coming at us, but we've got God coming back to fight that flesh. Whether it's our own flesh or someone coming at us. Problem with King Hezekiah, he also had a pride problem. He had to admit that. He had to repent of that as well, just like King David. Something about a king, you get all this power, it goes to your head. Not that any of us ever had that happen in our lives, right? No, no, because whether it's at work or it's home raising kids, we have a ten tendency to get prideful, right? Let's go for the work direction first. Uh, I was in cable business for 15 years, and so you start out as technician, then you move up to supervisor, and when you're supervisor, you go, hey, I'm in charge 10, 12, 15 people. I'm important. It's pretty good. And then if you're doing a good job, maybe leadership looks down upon you and goes, that's management material right there. Let's promote them. So you become manager and you go, whoa, 100 people under my belt. Yeah, I'm important. But you have that director over you and you go, oh, if I could just be director, 
six figures. Then I'd be all powerful. I saw Aladdin a few weeks ago. Um, <laughs> so you could come director, CEO, whatever it is, and you're in over a massive amount of people. You're making the big dollars. And you go, yeah, I'm pretty big. I'm pretty important. Kind of like uh, King David, he gets that crown. I'm king. These are all my subjects. Power. We get caught up in that. So we're not much different. We, it just looks different in our day and age than it did with these kings, but we're no different from the rest of them. That's something to remember. If you are reading through Kings, Samuel, Chronicles, yeah, we're not different from them. We're just in a different era. All right. So King Hezekiah has a kid. He's horrible. He goes back to false god worshiping, uh, Asherah poles, Baal, all that junk. And then his kid takes after his dad and does the same thing. But Hezekiah's great-grandson is awesome. He is something you want every one of your kids to turn out to be like. We're going to jump to 2 Chronicles 34, just like a page away. And we'll go through 27, 28. And it kind of sounds like his great-granddad. Because, and this is God speaking to uh, Josiah. It's King Josiah. That's the great grandson. Because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before God when you heard what he spoke against this place and its people, God spoke against the fact that Judah is way off base. They're following false gods. They need to get back on track with the Lord himself. And because you humbled yourself before me and tore your robes and wept in my presence, I have heard you, declares the Lord. Now I will gather you to your ancestors and you will be buried in peace. Your, excuse me, your eyes will not see all the disaster I am going to bring on this place and on those who live there. So it kind of starts off positive and then it kind of gets, you, sit, you, you feel it's a little negative in the end, right? What you need to know is like 22 years later, the Babylonians come in and they get evicted from their homeland to get taken away to Babylon. So that's the situation that's going on. So uh, King Josiah is being blessed in the fact that he gets peace in his land, in his home territory, until he passes away. Because then the next kids, the next kings, they're just horrible as well. As the one previously. Here's another thing about King Josiah. Go back to, still in chapter 31, but verses 1 through 4, it's pretty cool. Josiah was eight years old when he became king. That's how bad his dad was at being king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed the ways of, the, of his father, David. Old Testament, whenever they're doing good, they're following in the ways of their father, David. Not turning aside to the right or to the left. In the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father, David. In his 12th year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem, he's only 20 years old at this point, of high places, Asherah poles, and idols. Under his direction, the altars of, of Baals were torn down. He cut to pieces the incense altars that were above them and smashed the Asherah poles and the idols. So this is so cool because when we read in New Testament, it talks about the, the uh, faith of a child, right? And here it is way before Jesus is here on, as, as human, in human form here on this earth, it's talking about basically the faith of this child, Josiah, King Josiah. Comes in the reign at eight years old. At 20 years old, he's realizing we are so off base from following our God. We need to wipe out this nasty, sinful, uh, false God worshiping and get it the heck out of our lives. <laughs> That's what you want your kids to grow up in, right? For those of you who have children, those of you who will future, in the future have children, that's where we need to be as the examples for those children, whether our children or the people around us. If we're calling ourselves Christians, we need to be humble as David, as Hezekiah, and as Josiah are, putting God first and saying, you are in charge of my life, my kingdom, my family, my life will follow you, Lord. I will do as you call me to do. Not what I think is right, but what you say is right. And what's so cool in that is he's wired you to do these things you desire and that's the way he wants you to use yourself for his kingdom. Isn't that awesome? That's an awesome God. So it's not like he's saying, no, 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 no. Mike, you like speaking to people. You like working with youth. No, I'm not going to have you do that. You're going to be over here watching infants. He doesn't do that. I wired you for this. I'm going to use you in that. So use that for me, Mike. 
Use your creativity for me. And does the same each with each and every one of us. He is so wise. Isn't that God so wise? It's weird. It's like he's God or something. I don't know. <laughs> All righty. Uh, so we're coming to the conclusion of our conversation today. The band can start to mosey up this direction. Um, what's so cool, when David, when he repents and after the pestilence comes, uh, don't ask pestilence into your life. Again, don't do that. It's not fun with God. Um, when that happens, God tells him, build an altar and sacrifice for this sin that you, you have done here, David. And where he's at, there's a, we'll call him a farmer. He has his threshing floor there, and that's where God wants him to build an altar. And you, you've got the, uh, the guy who owns the threshing floor, floor also has the animals. And um, David is scared of that angel with that sword. Would you be scared of the angel of God with a sword in front of you saying, you've done bad and I'm here to take care of you? Yeah, you'd be scared too. And so instead of going to, to where Moses' tent is, which is in the city of Ephraim, um, instead of going there, he's scared of that angel. So he's building that altar there on the threshing floor. And the guy, as I was speaking about, the guy who owns the stuff says, David, just have it. Because I've seen that angel too. Scary stuff. God is real. I'm with you. Let's just take my threshing floor, take my animal sacrifice, do it. It's all yours. And David says, no, 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 no. This is on my shoulders. I'm the one who screwed up. I'm the one giving an offering to God. It has to be something from me. I will purchase everything from you and I'll pay for each and everything that I use from you. He takes that responsibility because if he's just sacrificing to God and it costs him nothing, what does that do, right? Where's your heart in that? So he does that sacrifice on that altar. He pays for everything. What's, what uh, later happens is when Solomon builds the temple, he builds the temple on that spot. That's kind of a neat story. <laughs> I kind of like that a lot. All right. Oh, throat's getting sore. Bye, Cap. James 4.10, James 4.10, James 4.10. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. We're Americans. We're already prideful just in that name alone. We're human. We're already prideful in just that name alone. The odds are against us. We need our God. We need to be humble. And he will pick us up. Speaking of humility, there's that Jesus character. I told you I'd bring him up by the end. <laughs> Jesus had to deal with the Pharisees back in the day, and it was the same pride issue within them. They thought life was all about them. They liked people looking up to them, respecting them, although they were horrible on the inside. Their hearts were not with God. Matthew 15, 8 is uh, speaking of Isaiah 29 to the Pharisees and about the Pharisees. And it says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Church, we cannot be like that. Our hearts have to be focused on God. We can't just come to church, as Don said today when she gave her testimony during tithing. We can't come and just say, yay, God, I'm a Christian. I'm here. Look, I'll... I'll do that little Christmas tree thing and, and buy a kid a pair of shoes and junk and yeah, I'm a good Christian and then not do anything else. No, everything in our life when we accept Jesus as our savior, everything in our life is about him. We just had uh, Zanon, a little fifth grader, uh, get baptized last week. I hope you, you guys got to see that. It's, it's pretty awesome. It's dear to my heart. <laughs> and he's stating when he goes in that water, I'm dead to myself. I am alive in Jesus. From this day forward, I no longer, longer live for me I live for you, God. I live for you. And all of us that are Christians, that's what we're called to do. Live for him in every aspect of our lives. We're going to roll into communion here and talk about humility. Jesus, the Lord God Almighty, comes down from heaven to earth to die for us. We screwed it up. He made it perfect. Uh, Joe is talking about this in, in, during worship. Simple fact that God becomes his creation to save us from our mistakes. Isn't that awesome? And as we take communion, we're reflecting back 2,000 years ago what he did for us. We've accepted it within the, our generation, right? Him as our Lord and Savior. But the act was 2,000 years ago. We reflect back on that act of him being beat, beaten and ripped to shreds with that cat of nine tails, and that blood just flowing from his body, his body being broken and ripped apart for our sins, each and every one of us. So in some ways, we're going to do communion the same. We're going to do it a little bit different, though. 
Um, eventually, not yet, eventually, second service was really quick at jumping up. Um, eventually, you're going to come up and get the, the uh, juice and the bread. And I want you to do that and then go back to your seat. And then I want you to go to your Jesus and reflect back to 2,000 years ago and what he did for you on that cross and just before getting up on that cross. Uh, we'll pray real quick, and then you can feel free to come up here and at your timing, take the juice, take the wine, and uh, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day, God. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for the example of David in his humility, Lord. He is king of a very, very great, powerful, and strong nation. It starts to get to his head, but you correct him, God, and he listens. And he humbles himself before you and says, God, it, I'm yours. Do what, with me what you will. God, may we take that into our own lives. May we stay humble from day to day because it's so easy for us to get prideful. We raise good kids. We do well at our jobs. We have talents, sports, arts, whatever it is. And we think, wow, I'm pretty good. May you humble us in those moments. May, may it not take much to humble us in those moments, God. May we know that we need you. We are yours and we are here for you, Lord Jesus. Again, thank you for your love. Thank you, Jesus, for you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. So feel free to come forward and, and get the juice.